topic that was given was mental and emotional health and well-being in children and um, we often talk about physical health a lot and we don't realize that there is a mental faculty that also is important and we need to give adequate attention to it because God in his mercy has given us that and expects us to actually use it for his glory. So in children, how does all this work? Recently, there was a friend of mine who put up a post where she now in her 40s said that she celebrated her 40th birthday. And through this time, she realized that she was going through a lot of difficulty simply because she was, she was brought up in a house, in a setup where expressing emotions was not really allowed. So even through the difficult times of life, she was taught not to cry, to handle her emotions by herself, which now was becoming difficult. She writes that she was able to swim for some time. Then now she decided to float and slowly she realized that she was beginning to sink. With this in the backdrop, we realize that how we bring up our children, how we give them the liberty to understand their emotions is very crucial for them to function in our society, in this world as able, efficient adults. So what is mental health? Mental, like we all know, relates to the mind or disorders of the mind we sometimes call as mental health issues or mental illnesses. Health is the state of being free from illness or injury or a state of absolute well-being. For us to understand mental health, we need to understand what the mind is. Certain things are very clear, like the brain, we know what it is, we know where it is. The parts of our body we can see, but the mind is something that we cannot see and often something that we confuse. So this is the part of the person that makes it possible for him or her to think, feel emotions and understand things. And therefore, we need to give the mind adequate importance and train our children on minding the mind. So mental health in children, when we speak about it, we talk about children's well-being in the mind, which involves in their thinking, well-being in their thinking and well-being in their emotions. Now, we all know that children don't exist in a vacuum, right? They don't exist in isolation either. They exist in a society and there are different influences that work on them. One is nature. What do they come into the world with? What is that unique fingerprint that God has put on them? That is their nature. Second is nurture. They've been given into a family, parents, sibling. And what are we investing into their lives? What is the environment uh, what is a family doing? What, how are they nurturing their child? And the third is the environment or the larger environment of school, peers, etc. that influence our growth. Now, what are emotions? This is something that we often use loosely. I feel, I feel very bad today. I feel depressed. But these words have a lot of inner meaning and stronger connotations that sometimes when people use these words, we do not fully and Dr. understand. Dr. Reba, yes? uh, sorry to interrupt you. Your no volume problem. is a little low. Is there any way we can make it a little uh, more audible? Can you hear me now? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's much better now. Okay. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Okay. So, um, continuing. Emotions, we need to understand what they are and it's an appraisal of the situation that your mind does that leads to action. Do they have a function in daily living? Of course they do. They energize behavior aimed at attaining personal goals. We all have a goal to attain. We all have certain purposes for which we are on this earth. And to attain that goal, emotions help us in our actions. For example, if I have an exam to write, I need to have a certain level of anxiety. If I'm over anxious, even if I'm well prepared, I will do poorly in that exam. In the same way, if I am not anxious at all or if I don't have any sort of fear towards the exam, my preparation, however uh, good it might seem it is, I will be very casual in my approach and therefore may not give it the best. So there is when we have to attain a goal, we need emotion 
to join with our cognition in other social behavior we all know that we are much more relaxed when we attend a wedding party than when it is your own wedding the third sensations different sensations we are surrounded in this world by beauty by taste by smell by by lovely sounds and we know even today when the family was singing truly god's mercy and that the, the song causes us to praise him right so therefore the sensations that we experience also has an effect on our emotions so emotions impact for any human being their cognitive functioning if emotions are well regulated the cognitive functioning is better emotions impact social behavior in how we interact with others how we approach problem situations involving people emotions play an influence on that and your physical well-being it is well known there are multiple verses in the bible as well as enough studies that show that your physical well-being is related to your emotions people tell us to exercise but we have to exercise the mind that's why god gives so much importance to a renewed mind to not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and therefore uh, physical well-being is related to your mind as well if your mind is relaxed or well then you will see that your body functions also are good there are multiple studies that show that chronic uh, long term lifestyle illnesses are related to uh people not being able to regulate their mind and their emotions well therefore emotions do impact our physical functioning now to understand emotions we all know that what our basic emotions are we all feel anger we all feel fear we all are sad at times and we all are happy and excited at times these are basic hum- human emotions but what we don't always look at is what children develop at 2 years and what we continue to have as adults self conscious emotions as they are called pride embarrassment guilt shame envy now these emotions actually are uh, not what we normally see we usually see the basic emotions and we judge them oh this person's very short tempered but there may be a sense of um uh, embarrassment that caused this person to be short tempered so before we judge we have to see what other self conscious emotions are playing their role the next factor of a child's nature that Im- impact their uh, behavior is their temperament we we again use this word oh this is the temperament of the child oh either either this is the personality okay but this is early appearing stable individual differences in reactivity within the same family i've heard so many mothers who come and tell me oh i can't believe it i raised them the same but they behave so differently their reactivity or quickness and intensity of emotional arousal is what determines one part of their temperament and self regulation how do they adjust that reactivity you may have one sibling who can be who can be quick to act the other one who is quick to fear and therefore slow to act so in the domains of affect in the domains of activity that is how much uh, energy do they put into their daily functioning and in the domain of attention that is including distractibility how distractible are they how much focused attention can they give in these three domains the temperament of a child is seen and for each of your children if you uh, analyze each of these domains you will see where they stand some may be active some may be a little slow but you know slow in activity but quick in thinking some may be able to pay attention for long periods of time for some you need to give frequent breaks so this is all built into their personality that fingerprint of god that comes with them so there are different temperaments we see some are easy children they can just merge with the crowd they can they are free they explore uh, some are difficult they take longer they are uh, not very easily consoled and some are slow to warm up and you, sometimes you find a blend of both this easy child but slow slow to warm up a difficult child also can be slow to warm up what is a child need to be well 
Now we spoke about there's an inherent nature, but what in the environment does a child look for to feel well? One is a balanced stimulating environment. Second are social interaction activities. Why is Zoom, Google Meet also popular during the pandemic? Simply because man, as an ad long back said, is a social animal and we all need to interact with people. They can lock us in our homes, but they cannot keep us from interacting. Therefore, phones and, and uh, you know, apps have become very famous now. Social media is very, very happening. Cognitively challenging tasks. You've been given a mind that likes to work. An idle mind, like we always say, is a devil's workshop. So you need to have cognitively challenging tasks that help them to, to keep their mind occupied and be constructive. Self-engagement. We cannot always engage them. Sometimes you need to take a step back and see what the child does in his spare time. That will tell you what is playing up in their mind. Physical activities. Just like the emotions impact physical well-being, physical activities impact the emotion. A lot of pent-up energy, pent-up emotion does get dissipated when the children have physical activities. So I'm going to give you one minute during which time if you have a pen and paper close by you can probably write in this time if you have children um, what are some of the social interaction activities your child does daily what are the cognitively challenging tasks your child does daily what are have you seen them engage themselves in and what are some of the physical activities that have happened even something like you know, wringing clothes of water and hanging them out to dry is a physical activity. So any sort of domestic chore can be added on into that. So if you can just list down and I will ask you uh, at the end of it, at the end of one minute. So your time starts now. Okay, I hope some of you have had some time to jot it down. So if, um, I know the group is big, but in smaller groups when we conduct workshops, what we ask, we usually tell parents to share. So um, if, okay, let me just open my chat box. Okay, if parents are willing, could you please just list some of the social interaction activities you've seen your child engage in during this time of pandemic? Maybe in the last six months. I'll I'll just take a couple and then we'll move on. If you're free to type, please type. Reading, drawing, playing with the neighbors, cartoons. Okay, thank you. What are some of the cognitively challenging tasks you've seen your child engage in? Thank you. Chess, what else? Map. Okay, thank you. When your child is alone, not with people, what have you seen them do? Okay, thank you. And physical activities. Oh, 
Okay, great. Thank you very much for being such active participants. Uh, so, so you all have an idea as to what your children are doing. And during the pandemic, what we noticed when this question was asked in an online survey was there was a 30 to 50 percent increase in gadget use during this time. So social interaction was using a gadget, cognitively challenging tasks involved gadgets. So I'm glad in this group I see a lot of other things such as Lego and blocks and, and imaginative play coming in. So that is really good. So well done parents. Now this is what a child needs in his or her daily schedule or environment to be well. What are the protective factors for emotional development? What should be there in the environment so that the child is emotionally well? One is parental sensitivity. How alert, aware and available are you to your child? Second is support. Does your child feel supported within the home? If yes, then you will see that the child is emotionally more competent. Clear expectations and limits. I feel that in parenting, most often what we keep changing is our limits, our expectations. We have to be clear whether your child is 2 years or 15 years. You need clear expectations. I will talk about this further. Foster effortful control. That is what we will come towards at the end. Basically to say that a child is allowed to feel emotions but should also know how to regulate these emotions and use them effectively. So when, when are we effective as parents? How can I say that if somebody comes to me for a consultation, how do I say that these parents are effective in parenting and therefore there may be other factors that is causing this problem, not really the parenting. For effective parenting, one, parents need to have good parental mental health. Okay, so whatever I've shared about mental health with regard to effortful control, self-regulation, awareness of emotions, ability to engage meaningfully with others is a sign of good parental health. Marital harmony. This is my biggest struggle at times when we meet parents. Even when they come for sessions, they cannot seem to agree on certain things and they fight in front of the child. What we often don't realize is children are smarter than us at, at these times. And what they do is they take advantage of this. Whoever is on their side, they will side with that person. So therefore, we normally tell parents, you want to argue about something, argue after the child sleeps. When you have a problem in front, whoever says the first thing, go with that for the moment. And then if a similar situation, hap situation happens next time, then you can tarry over it by having discussed. Favorable economic conditions. What do we mean by favorable economic conditions? This is not money. This is not related to how big a house you have. This is related to within my economic resources, within my space, within my uh, ability to provide Am I able to maintain a sense of emotional and mental well-being within the four walls of my home? If you are not able to manage within your economic conditions, then your child will feel the stress of it and not be able to cope. Despite all this, we may see this a lot in children. And is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. Children also are learning the ways of the world and we can help them in this. So we need to first of all understand emotional development. Is it wrong if my child cries? Is it wrong if my child screams? Is it wrong if my child hits? These are questions that we ask. It is wrong in the sense of moral development, but when the child expresses like this, what should I do? So to understand emotional development in the first year of life, you see smile, you see laughter. Towards the end of the first year, you see fear, disgust and anger being expressed. In the second year of life, you see self-conscious emotions emerging. They are able to label emotions of others. They are empathetic towards you. If a mother cries, they will come close. If they see their sibling upset, they will go closer to them. In the third year, they learn that they can also feel angry, but they learn to control anger and aggression in presence of their adults. They may be pushing or shoving their sibling, but the moment the mother walks into the room, they turn into little angels. 
they express more with their peers so the good and the bad emotions or the acceptable and the not acceptable expression of emotions is seen more with children they begin to internalize society's rules so this is where they are learning what is expected by age 4 they acquire the ability to assess their emotional expression and they also have two types of emotional display one is pro social which is to protect another's feelings so they will side up with friends though not active like you see in teens but they will do this and there is protective that is they mask emotions in order to save oneself from negative consequences so as early as in kindergarten you begin to see children hiding things when they do it now there are certain traits that we are given as humans resultant of the fall and these are examples of that so can children be wrong can children be evil can they do bad things yes they can and innately they have it in them to do that we as humans are born with it right so the most parents when they come and tell me you know my child behaves like this i ask them did you expect them to do differently and they say yeah they, they, he's so young how can he be like this i said we are innately born with this ability to do wrong you know if you if you doubt it give one toy to two two year olds and see how they play from 7 and upwards they display a wider uh, variety of self regulation by self regulation i mean they are more competent at hiding things they are more competent at suppressing their uh, negative emotions and they are also able to you know hide their excitement or even overly express their excitement adolescents behave as if they were in front of an audience where every action is evaluated and we in society treat them like this which is actually quite unfair because if you go back to your ages 12 to 17 you will see that you know being constantly pinned on or being constantly judged we didn't like it so now we do the same to our children if they are adolescents but the adolescent is very very self conscious and therefore their emotional outbursts also are a little higher so what are the most common and typical challenges that we face especially in children less than 10 years temper tantrums aggression such as hitting kicking spitting punching others refusal to share wait or take turns inconsolable crying breaking or misusing toys and equipment excessive shyness or excluding other children you know they themselves will not want to include other children or they get excluded because of their shyness and difficulty to interact now what do i do i see all these problems what am i supposed to do and i think this is the worst that has always been a guiding light train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it now how do i train i what does the word train mean teach remind admonish instruct and nurture these five things are what we're going to talk about now a little in detail how can parents help first parents need to understand behavior and understand emotion what is the difference or what, how does the behavior express the emotion instruction while you instruct children you are teaching them you are reminding them of certain rules of certain guidelines of of aspects as to why they have to behave in in a, in a particular way correction despite this mistakes happen despite this there will be wrongs that time how do i correct my child reinforcement if my child does something right and i have to build up that skill how do i nurture it now behavior we all know is the acting out of an emotion it can serve the purpose of a way of communication children who don't have language tend to be more physical children who have language tend to be more verbal and could be abusive but they also could say a lot of nice things to you and explain things very well and it's always a response to the environment so we need to as parents identify the emotion that is conveyed and teach appropriate ways of expressing the emotion and that is called emotion coaching so i can be angry but how i express that anger is important i can sense that somebody is has achieved something how do i express the joy and the happiness for that person both need to be 
taught so first of all children cannot you know uh, channelize multiple energies they need to be regularized a bit so when you talk about a balanced environment is like they need a schedule for the day not like the summer schedule that is shown in the cartoon so they need fairly fixed play times meal times sleep times do not overfeed do not let them oversleep or undersleep more engaged the child is the less disruptive he or she gets if children are bored they can be violent if children are sick if children are hungry if children are thirsty if children are tired they get harder to manage so we as parents need to be aware of that engagement should be based on child's ability age and tolerance now we need to understand that parents are the ultimate role models for their children every word movement and action has an effect no other person or outside force has a greater influence on a child than the parent you're a 24 hour manual on how to survive in this world how to behave how to love parents what you do is what your children learn so we need to be clear in our instructions when your child is 6 don't tell them stop behaving like a 6 year old so how do you instruct them you shall catch them i've put them like 10 commandments i hope this helps thou shall catch them being good and of the mark this is self explanatory thou shall be a role model um a lot of parents have this issue they come and say he's only 3 you know but he gets so angry and when angry he'll throw the remote throw the phone and i keep i go back and i ask them you know who among you is short tempered is there anybody in the family sometimes it's the grandfather sometimes grandmother sometimes father sometimes mother and i said is there any way you can regulate that then you your child will see that and change your their lifestyle thou shall set realistic limits this is a problem that i have for older children parents set different limits one one is allowed to be out till 10 o'clock at night one has to be back home by 6 o'clock in the evening so why are your limits different you have to set realistic limits thou shall enforce limits consistently they don't learn it just because you've written it on paper and stuck it on your wall they learn it only if you enforce it if you are lenient with it they will learn to stretch their time especially now in the pandemic when children get out they find it harder to come back inside thou shall stand firm choose your battles and stand firm on what you think truly god wants you to stand for correction despite me instructing if there are mistakes what do i do just as much as we need guidance and you are attending talks like this children also need guidance and they need manuals on how to understand our behavior she said the same thing yesterday but she wasn't this mean today why is she so upset because i did this i've had many teens who come and say can you please ask my parent to leave the room then i will tell you and that is the saddest thing that i i hear you know their children should be most comfortable with their parents they should feel the the ease of sharing their struggles with their parents but most often that doesn't happen and people like us need to intervene in between so why do we punish you know what is the purpose of punishment why were the israelites punished 40 years one to introduce discipline two to decrease undesirable behavior now in india we use different kinds of punishments and they can be physical but what does research show it's ineffective because for everything you end up beating and the child doesn't know when to expect it and when he is going to get it or when he is not going to get it verbal screaming use of names does not help it is ineffective firm voice and instruction what do you expect environmental such as time out removing privileges have been found to be effective just as much as we correct inappropriate behavior we also have to reward appropriate healthy behaviors so it is used to serve to increase the desirable behavior how can you do it attention how do i give attention to my child my child has helped me with something saw me carrying many things in my hand offered to help came and carried a few bags then you praise you attend to that good behavior and you say thank you so much affection the child you asked for a glass of water 
willingly brought it. Then you show affection, appreciation. The child has done well. He scored 50% in the last exam. This exam, he got 55%. Appreciate that. He's made an effort to move up. Tangible. What is your reward that you would like to give your child for good performance, good behavior, multiple stars and desirable activities? You know, a child has studied so hard for board exams. At the end of it, shouldn't the child be allowed to go for a summer camp where he gets to unwind? So what he likes is offered as a reward. Most commonly used word by parents is no. You know, I've had even toddlers tell me he will drop a toy and then say, Oh no, no, no. They seem to learn that faster than they learn other words. And that's because they've heard it so often. It's usually that we fight a losing battle. Tell them what you would like them to do. No climbing, no sitting, no touching, no pulling, no pushing. Instead of that, could you please tell them, pull up a chair, stand on that and look outside the window. Instead of pulling the toy from your brother's hand, could you please ask him nicely to give it to you? If your brother's younger than you, he doesn't understand what you're saying, you offer him another toy and give. Now you might say, by the time I explain so much, my child is already gone. But that is where your firm instruction and voice comes into effect. What works for younger children? Because they don't understand too much of elaborate language. If there is a tantrum, less than two, you tend to distract them. You can ignore the tantrum. They cry for a while and they settle when they don't get attention. Attention when they are throwing a huge tantrum can be a reinforcer. Redirecting. We have videos where we've seen children, you know, throwing a tantrum and suddenly you say, you tell them, hey, look outside the window, there goes Spider-Man. It all stops and then they're searching for Spider-Man. So was that thing, what they're crying for, really important? No, it wasn't. Offering choices really works. With older children, of course, distracting them, redirecting them doesn't really work because their memory is really strong. So beyond three years, if your child is verbal, understands a lot more language, begin to dialogue with them. Secondly, despite dialoguing, if there is bad behavior, you have to give them timeouts. There are families that have said, ma'am, now I get him to sit in the corner, but it's become one game for him. He goes and sits there and comes back. That's because timeout always needs to be followed by dialoguing. Removing privileges and offering choices. These are what work for older children. So who helps in emotional coaching? Emotional coaching does involve a lot of training. And who, who is involved? Parents, teachers, professionals. There are times when I've spent about four or five sessions just helping a parent see how to handle a tantrum. And then they have to, they have to schedule another appointment and come back because they've come for some other need actually. But this was the pressing need. The behavior really presses in and therefore we need to work with it. So good parenting involves emotion. Be willing to share your emotions. Be willing to share your struggles. Don't act like a superhero in front of them. You know, They should see your vulnerabilities, your failures. And if you made a mistake, be willing to accept it. That sense of humility you should have before your children. And process of emotion coaching involves becoming aware of your child's emotion Recognize the emotion as an opportunity for intimacy and teaching. Most often, preteens and teens feel let down by their parents. And if that is gone, then even in adulthood, they don't share a strong bond. So when they are upset, even as young as four years, five years, spend time with them. You can switch off the gas and come and spend time with them. This time is precious. Listen empathetically, validating the child's feelings. I've had children who come and say, you know, I've been bullied in school. I came and told my mother and she just said, ignore it, leave it. But the bullying is really getting to me. You need to listen empathetically to what the child's going through. Validate the child's feelings. I know it's hard. It is difficult. What could you do? You need to give them realistic solutions. It doesn't work. Let them come back to you. Then seek teacher's help. Help the child find words to label the emotion he's having and set limits while exploring strategies to solve the problem at hand. Um, so how does emotion coaching help? It gives you better physical health, 
children tend to score higher in academics because they're able to regulate a lot of their feelings. They get along better with friends. They have fewer behavior problems. They are more resilient. They're able to soothe themselves, bounce back from distress, and they end up being emotionally intelligent adults. They also need to learn how to survive in the society. So how you manage yourself and how you get along with other kids, with other people is also a part of emotional coaching and good emotional coaching. You see that children are able to do this in the social setup. How does it affect behavior? They become more emotionally intelligent and for you to know as a teenager or as a young adult, I'm sorry, How to handle your own feelings, how well you empathize and get along with other people. So high scores on emotional intelligence tests, what do we notice in their behavior? They have fewer negative behaviors and emotions at school. They were less likely to let their difficulties interfere with their peer relations and learning. They were less likely to experience negative emotional symptoms, conduct problems, hyperactivity problems, problems with their peers. They are able to manage whatever stress comes their way as young as 11 years, 10 years. Uh, they were generally obedient. They stay on task and are able to concentrate and finish. They were likely to have many friends because people really trust them. And that is also because, you know, you have given them that they were less likely to pick on or bully their friends and were rated by te by their teachers as being considerate of others feelings sharing with other children etc if they have a low emotional intelligence which is again evident by the time they're nine or ten they have a lot of what we call psychosomatic symptoms they end up having being frequently ill or complaining of stomach ache headache they cry easily they're nervous in new situations they're easily scared they seem not to have developed effective coping strategies to help them deal with any school difficulties, classroom or peer problems. And therefore, this is seen more in schools. And it is predicted now with post-pandemic, we are going to see some of these things increase in schools. In closing, I'd like to say children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. And we value our gifts, don't we? We value our phones which have been gifted to us. We value even small things that a loved one has given us. How much more should we value our children then? Therefore, spend a lot of time loving them and praying for them. I would like to stress on a few things that are biblically given and how you apply it to your parenting. How do I love my child? Love is patient. Do I show adequate patience to my child or do I react for the smallest thing? Love is kind. Am I kind to them? Love is not boastful. How do I boast in my parenting? I got more marks than you when I was in your class. Envious. How do you say that you are envious of your children? I never had these fancy tennis rackets when I was your age. See what all you have, what all I'm giving you. Partly boastful, partly envious. Proud. See how much I have achieved in my life. What are you doing with your life? Love does not speak like that. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. You don't look for your comfort by harming your children. Love is not easily angered. And this is beautiful because most often we react to our children because we are angry, not because they need to be, uh, not because you need to react to them like that. And love keeps no record of wrongs. Last week you broke that tumbler. This week you broke the glass window. Next week I don't know what you're going to break. Keep no record of wrongs. Love always protects. Parenting is a task that begins from when the child falls into your arms. For mothers, when they birth in your womb, when you're aware of it, till I think it never ends. Even after parents become grandparents, they are still parents, right? And they all love always protects. Love always trusts. Do your children trust you? Do you trust your children? Then it means that you love them. If you've invested well in them, if you've trained them, then you should trust them. Love always hopes, even when they make mistakes, even if it is a persistent mistake. I've been trying and trying and trying. I've been loving and loving and loving and still I see no change. Love always hopes. 
that's what the good lord does for us he always hopes that we will change love always perseveres we continue to persevere as parents we continue to pray over them we continue to cry with them we continue to enjoy with them we continue to be excited for them we persevere even when the road is narrow when the going gets tough we persevere and having done this we will take them to great heights and we could stand before the lord one day and say thank you lord because who you gave us made us better adults helped us understand the love of a father from heaven all children have within them the potential to be great kids it is our job to create a great world where this potential can flourish let us leave to the our children a better world and let us leave the world better adults by training our children well thank you the first question is any specific guidance to single mothers especially since the marital harmony element will be missing for them mothers who are separated who are single okay um thank you for that question single parents i know it's a hard job um if there is a marital discord and and god has allowed it in your life for whatever reason reasons that you are aware of and reasons that you know of i would say be transparent about it with your children and uh, let them also share your journey if there are other adults in your life um, let them also participate in helping you raise this child but the single parent should take responsibility in instructing in guiding in teaching and nurturing your child um, so i hope that answers your question but be transparent i think that's the easiest way and that children can think for themselves so they will figure it out okay thank you uh, another question my children use gadgets more during this pandemic and they are unable to do their studies how can i help them to use their time effectively yeah so this is where limit setting comes in the american psychiatric association the american psychological association and now even nimhans in india they've come out with clear guidelines of how much time gadgets can be used for younger than 5 5 uh, years there are limits only social video chatting is what is suggested so for older children i don't know how old your kids are but it's 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours i would say excluding school time 1 hour 1 and 1/2 hours and uh, but there should be family viewing it can't be that the child is allowed to be alone on the gadget by themselves so um Uh, if this is at the cost of academics i would say a total like a de addiction program remove the gadget except for school remove the gadget and if there's homework that you need the gadget for you sit with them and do it and apart from that find other things that entertain the child can be physical activities can be board games can be even baking a cake together so find other things that will engage them i hope this helps thank you another question two of my kids are entirely different one child is very emotionally sensitive gets hurt easily and cries he also forgives and expresses his love to others but my second child is very strong and doesn't care whatever happens how to handle this so you increase the emotional intelligence on one and bring bring in more awareness in the second so your first one is sensitive you make him stronger by saying that we don't you know there is uh, you can teach them how to grade their emotions so how hurt are you by this event so he may say i am you know 8 and 9 so you can ask what will help us make it a 5 or a 6 and he might say if if i don't pay too much attention to what is said and for your child who's strong and doesn't seem to care you need to bring in a lot more pro social elements to help him understand that other people feel hurt by what he does and there are also times when we advise parents let the strong one loose you deliberately make them loose so that they also begin to feel some of those emotions we try to protect our children from a lot of these negative emotions but sometimes they need to experience it so that as adults they are able to handle some amount of failure in life 
I hope that answers the question. Okay. I think that's very helpful. Another question. My son, who is eight years old, tend to copy and imitate whoever and whatever he sees, talking pattern, dressing, etc. How do I make him understand that he needs to be himself? First of all, what is he, what are his skills? You will have to define that. You have to list it out and stick it in front of his table so that every morning he can read it. If he has become so lost in imitating multiple people, it's likely that he will not know what are his skills and what, what is it that he has taken from others. So if you as a parent have seen unique qualities of his, list it down, stick it on his wall so that every day he, he reads it and says, this is who I am. And if he is imitating good things, if the accent of somebody helps him speak better, I would say let it be. Um, dressing sense, etc. is again something within limits. It's acceptable. And sometimes in younger children, uh, you said eight years, right, Sharon? Yeah. So in eight years, actually, they should have outgrown a bit of this observation, imitation based learning they should begin to have their own self-conscious activities develop. So you can probably reinforce what he does by himself and uh, he, will, he will outgrow that. Another question. My child as a preteen was a very active, enthusiastic and sociable child. Now she has become a teenager and is always shut in the room. She doesn't talk to anyone and doesn't like to socialize. Why did this change come? How can I deal with it? If it is the change due to the pandemic, I think we'll have to wait till things open out a little bit more. But um, I would be a, a little cautious if your teen is always stuck inside the room. For starters, I would suggest that you also share her space in the sense of, you know, you go sit with your book in her room so that you are conveying that you're available if she wants to talk and also you are you are uh, visualizing what she does. If she has become, there are some children who face some sort of issues in school and therefore withdraw within themselves. They are not able to fully understand the situation. So they feel it's better if I just sit and read books or, you know, focus on things like that. So you can probably check what it is and then uh, respond. But begin by sharing her space, then slowly include other adults she trusts and she likes to interact with her, can be her friends, you can have a small party at home where she is included. So you bridge the gap if she is not able to. Okay, I think there's another question from another mother. How do I help my 11 year old son to be an extrovert? See, I think, uh, would you like to be something you're not? is a question I would like to place. We often want children doing best. We want children, you know, just flourishing. I think um, two years ago, if I'm right, there was a, a tweet of a mother that went very, became very popular. And it was because she wrote great things about her son, how much he struggled to get his 60% in board exams. Okay, so I would say, what is your child's quality? Extrovert enough? To, to go out shopping, to manage as an adult independently. Yes, we need to train him for that in the sense of you go with him, take him out, let him experience. But extrovert in the sense of I want him to, you know, lead worship in church. Idea is good, but does he want to? He may be happy just playing in the band at the back, which is fine. He's still glorifying God, isn't he? So you have to see what your child has and build on that. Don't try to push them beyond their comfort zone because I don't think we as human beings are very happy to move too much beyond our comfort zone. We do include many layers, but I think uh, if he wants to, if he has to achieve something by being extrovert, then we can train him. In which case then, um, you know, training him is by graded exposure to, to few social events. So... This is not the forum where I can talk in detail about it, but yeah, a graded exposure. Little by little exposing them helps to build, make them more extrovert. Another question, my child lacks self-motivation. I do motivate her, but more than certain point, I get tired. She is excessively shy also. 
please can you share a practical solution you choose events where you want to motivate her don't motivate her for everything certain things have to come from her um, by 8 to 9 years actually children should have an internal locus of control wherein we say that they don't need reinforcements from outside to do things it should come from within them so if you can take a step back and you know motivate her for things that are essential but take a step back and see what she is comfortable doing on her own and encourage her to do those things regularly once she does you know five activities regularly on her own then little by little for example um, you said she's excessively shy so you have cooked something or she has helped you bake something and you want to share it with your neighbors ask her if she's willing to just go give it next door she may be willing if you have a a milkman or a vegetable vendor coming home could you just give her the money and say go give it to that uncle so begin um, you know exposing her or helping her meet new people who she is comfortable with and familiar with and then build to uh, people she doesn't know so usually uh, you know meeting strangers is what makes them more shy and more withdrawn so start with familiar adults familiar children and then build it up from there i hope that answers your question and if she is shy um, unless she needs to let's not push her cross her limits if she is able to manage and get through her day i think that's good usually uh, sorry did you mention an age sharan no age wasn't mentioned okay yeah so children who are shy even um, when they enter their preteens or teens they become more comfortable with their friends so at that age you see a little bit of the shyness and introvert uh, behavior coming down so if she is not yet that age then just wait okay there is another question this is related to home schooling i home school my children do you think that the mental and emotional well being or development of children could be inhibited by home schooling uh, it depends on how many children you have uh, if you have three or four children i think that's a mini school mini classroom in itself so which is yeah i think but there's more than four, four children at least yeah okay. in this case yeah in that case then that's fine but if they have exposures to things like sunday school if they have exposure to to other social events cousins meeting then i think they have a lot of social exposure which again gives them opportunities for events that can uh, increase emotional well being so okay. uh, if there's good connect with you and good connect with a social network i don't think that should be an issue okay Another question is about anger management. My son is eighteen years old, and he has anger issues. How to deal with this? Eighteen is is quite a quite an age. <laughs> so uh, I would suggest uh, you know uh, asking him if he wants to deal with it. In which case, there are what we call cognitive behavior therapies, um, which actually help anger management programs, which help. so because it's 18 it may be a little more established than when it is at 6 or 8 so it it helps having an external person do it with him rather than trying it from home but at home if you've set your limit i would say stick to it if he if he gets short tempered and does things i think he should fix it when they are angry please don't react because it's not going to help your uh, your raising your voice or or making you know matters worse will only you getting angry along with him will make matters worse what i would say is remove yourself from the situation let him stand where he is let him scream where he is uh, but you move away from there so that you are not triggered to also uh, react um, but get him help it it usually works if he wants to then it works there's another question on how to deal with a child who lacks focus also related to this there's another question my child does not have focus and cannot concentrate on one matter for more than 10 minutes but i don't know the age of this child it's not mentioned they're also asking 
when do you think we should seek medical help? Um, yeah, so the age is very crucial. Um, if they are four years and they can attend only for 10 minutes, then um, practically I would, I would ask you to, you know, um, alternate between something to do with the eye and the hand, um, like uh, building a Lego puzzle or uh, doing, uh, doing blocks or puzzles and an academic activity like reading three lines of a storybook, not the whole book, just three lines. So alternate between a physical task and uh, a learning task and see if your child can sustain for slightly longer than 10 minutes. If the child is older, eight years, they should be able to at least focus for an entire class period, which is about 30, 35 minutes um, with, uh, with breaks in activities, meaning little bit of listening, little bit of doing, little bit of writing, all should be integrated. Um, if, if your child is older than that and still it's 10 minutes, then you have to see if there's any other. Um, it's known now that gadgets and electronic addictions can affect attention span. So please get help. I would say remove all gadgets. Give them a lot of physical activity at the start of the day, in the middle of the day, and the end of the day so that in between they can focus. It's, it's a lot because I don't know um, your situation. It's hard for me to be very precise. But uh, you start with small things like this, build it from 10 minutes to 15 minutes by engaging him yourself. If it doesn't work, then get professional help. Okay. Sometimes my four-year, nine-month-old son withdraws himself when we try to bring discipline to him, even when he knows he is doing wrong. He's okay after some time. But how to deal with such withdrawals? Um. I would say it's okay if they withdraw um, because they also need time to process what has happened. So uh, if he knows he's done something wrong, then he will withdraw himself. You don't need to, you know, again, pinpoint the mistake. You can probably just ask him what happened and he will say, he will tell you the event or he will give you excuses for it. And then you say, you can, you can be firm in what you're saying that I know what you did and I know it's not acceptable. You know, you have to figure out whether you want to continue it or not. So if they withdraw after that, let him withdraw, let him process, let him come back. But before the end of the day, talk about it, because I think that helps them recover, you know, that they, they should know that you haven't judged them. But what you asked them was out of love and your correction was out of love and that you still love them and you still trust them. Okay, there are two questions that are... Uh, kind of similar. One is about my four-year son still pees on his clothes. There's another question. My child is two years, four months old. She's not ready to go, go to toilet for peeing. She searches a corner in the house or she passes it on the sofa or bed. It is a struggle for us to make her go to toilet. How can I train her for this? So one is a four-year-old son. Another is a two-year, four-months-old daughter. Okay, uh, four-year-old daytime uh, control should have been achieved. If it is not achieved, I think seek medical guidance as to why it's happening. Um, uh, for your two-year, four-month-old, uh, some of them don't like closed spaces or bathroom spaces, especially in apartments if your bathrooms are closed or it affects, uh, she knows that she's passing because she is going to a corner. So I would suggest, can you start with, you know, uh, putting her potty outside of the toilet for starters and uh, you could also uh, you know show her in between the day where her favorite doll you know in a form of imaginary play you take the doll to the bathroom and uh, make the doll sit on the the commode and you know slowly show her that see her toys are willing see mama goes dada goes therefore you can also go and this is where it should be done otherwise it will stink despite that if she still does it outside then I think you should ask her to clean up. So she, okay. she takes the cloth and wipes. She puts her dirty panty in, in the water and uh, she hangs it out to dry. Two year, four months, I think they follow that much. So you can do it. Uh, there's another question on using bad words. My child is around three years old. Due to some reasons, we are staying with our in-laws. My child is learning and repeating all the bad words. 
how to communicate with her please suggest ma'am okay um i wonder where he's speaking the bad words from if it is from your in laws i would suggest that at the end of every day you tell him that these words are not acceptable and if he is picking it up from you your spouse or from tv um if it's from you or your spouse then uh, you need to correct yourself if he's picking it up from tv or cartoons i think you need to take away the cartoons and tv uh, programs that have bad language in them uh, and every time he does speak a bad word he has to probably get a black star because around 3 years they see visual things and that really works so for every good thing he says he gets a golden star for every bad thing he says he gets a black star and every black star uh, you know five black stars and he loses some privilege of his maybe half an hour of tv time or whatever so if you can dialogue with him if they are verbal and they understand uh, visual charts better you could probably use them at home and see how it works and if it is okay. adults in the house who are using bad language i would suggest restrict the amount of time he has with them okay another question my son is 14 years old in 10th class he is always interested in doing work outside the house but very less interested in studying or reading the bible what to do have you talked to your son about this it's not me who should be answering this question it's your son and uh, if he is avoiding studying is it because certain topics are hard for him in which case get him help is he avoiding studying because you know uh, it's it's too laborious and too much of an effort see if there are other ways you can help him learn it there are umpteen number of youtube videos on topics there are number of teachers now who've put up information online on you know videos and practical ways of learning something so help him develop his concepts by watching those videos then he can build see if there's any buddy of his who can come and work with him as well so they do homework together or they they learn a particular topic together sometimes group study helps and um, so you could also tell him that for every half an hour of study you get half an hour of play so if he studies for an hour he gets to go out in the evening and play for an hour you want to reduce the play time you give longer study time and less play time so you say for every one hour of study time you get half an hour of play time and okay that answers your question so i have some 20 questions more i'm sure uh, we are not going to be able to answer all of them so i'm just going to pick and choose a few uh, we are very sorry we are not able to answer your question so i'm going to give priorities to those who asked first okay mm-hmm. uh, so yeah the next question is if i may interrupt yes yes uh, right at the start i noticed a question yes, please. about uh, their son being yeah. agnostic and um, i okay, think it's, yeah. it's more about seek and find knock and the door shall be opened unto you so there is uh, the the spiritual development of your child is between your child and god you can you can instill certain things but uh, one thing that god reminded me is i cannot carry my son's cross so when each of our crosses help us learn more about him and his provisions so therefore i think take a step back you don't be the spiritual mentor for some time pray you know as as couples pray over your children and uh, let god do his work he has called each of us and you know um, i don't think parents should carry the guilt of the choices children make as adults but definitely you should uh, you know what they choose at 9 or 11 is not what they will live with at 40 we should know that so therefore let them walk that journey and you know they have their own journey through which they will discover life and discover god so let them go on that journey till then you pray and live with hope that our god who saved us can save him also thank you over to you sharat yeah uh dr reeba is it okay to take a couple of more questions yes hey, i am in no okay. hurry if you are in no hurry <laughs> okay 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 so another question is my 4 year old son doesn't eat rice or veg curry but rice is the main food source in my family how can i make him habituated to eating rice ha huh. i struggle with that even now so <laughs> I, i i get what you're asking um 
I would say that you know if it is um, if there's anything else that you can offer alternate meals then offer that um, for rice I would say if there's anything he likes increase on that protein content or like fish you give him two pieces fish we usually give rice because we want them full but I would say you know increase on other things if he likes a vegetable you give more of that he doesn't like veg curry then um, you know if there's any other curry that he likes and you have it then you increase the proportion of that and give them that uh, or salads whatever uh, they tolerate better you increase on that and reduce the rice portion over time and uh, also you can reinforce them saying you finish this amount of rice and finish this portion that has been served to you then you get dessert or a fruit so it's more about uh, what I normally tell mothers is uh, you know it's more about the the calories and the balanced diet it is not so much about the amount that they eat yes okay another question is nowadays we being a nuclear family many children do not know how to mingle with other children we parents have to teach them how to do it effectively you this is not something you learn in theory it's something you learn by practice how to be with other children how to you know uh, play with other children so you need to provide opportunities if you live in apartments I'm sure there are a lot of children around if you live in um, independent houses uh, if you have family friends or cousins or extended family meet them at least once in a fortnight and uh, see what your child does or does not do and train them in that interim period and then expose them to that same social setup two weeks later and you will see that they mingle better so it's it's practical learning hopefully schools will reopen soon and we can get back to it yeah uh, another question is bible says spare the rod and spoil the child so how do we address that what is your opinion yeah um, we take a lot of things very literally at times you know uh, I find a lot of parents beat children because the parent is angry. I'm also guilty of that. After a long day's work, even the smallest thing can trigger you. So uh, by beating, if you beat for everything, the child doesn't know what he has done wrong. So I, I've known parents who first tell them, because you did this, you're going to get one adi on your hand and then give so then it is done in love it is done in correction and then after the adi when the child cries the parent is available in the same room we usually beat them when they cry we tell them to keep quiet not make a noise and you know make emotionally the child becomes more uh, more upset than what they did so therefore I think uh, you know I, I wouldn't say spare the rod in that sense but if the rod is not helping you achieve godly parenthood if God was to take the rod each time we sinned, I think we'll have a lot of answering to do. So use discretion, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Okay, so even when the rod is used, used in love and compassion and explaining to the child how it is done. Yeah, I wouldn't use a rod. I would usually say use your hand and hit below the knee. So it's not the question of, you know, pain, etc. But just uh, the, the knowing that my parent has done something it should be more for the fear of, of the the fear that we have towards God similarly yeah another question is I sometimes worry that I'm too strict but I don't know how to probably balance it yeah I think you've answered your question yourself <laughs> you agree that you need to balance it so um, check choose your battles that's what I would say in a forum like this it's not possible for me to to individually ask you you know but uh, you list down where all you need to set limits and, and set limits only on those don't pick on everything you know the child should have a freedom of movement at freedom of exploration because they have to grow in themselves also so unless there is something definitively wrong I would say the limit doesn't come into place so choose and love if you love them then you will also not be so strict okay love cover okay, i think we will take the last two questions now because we are yeah. running out of time 
my child is 13 years old and is addicted to games how to overcome this i think probably it's online games that's not specified okay uh, see online games have in them the ability to be addictive okay because it does affect uh, your neurotransmitters in the brain and therefore if you are saying is addicted to games i would say with the consent of the child remove the gadget in a graded manner away from the child and give them something else to do secondly it causes a lot of over stimulation of the brain therefore there's a lot of physical energy which keeps drawing them back into especially if they are games that involve fighting or speed or things like that you know mm-hmm. so therefore if it is not cognitively challenging to the child then that game is getting to be you know um, getting to over stimulate the child therefore the child will need a lot of physical activity so if your swimming pools have opened to take them swimming or if there is a ground close by let him go run uh, let her go go have a jog or go out with friends just for a meal so that you know she travels a bit and and gets her head out of this if she's able to focus on other things it's not an issue still but if she's not able to let go of this and focus on other things i think you really need to get help uh one last question probably we will ask i'm sorry because we have so many more questions but unfortunately we are not able to address them today but you have good news which i'll be sharing soon uh this question is my son who will be 5 doesn't listen to me in one or two commands i have to keep repeating myself many times even to make him sit for food how to change this habit yeah so one of the uh the commandments that i gave was thou shall connect before you direct so if he is in another room and you're screaming from the kitchen there's no way he's going to attend to you if he's 5 years old so go close to him physically turn him towards you tell him time for a meal and bring him to the table he will come but if he is self absorbed in something he's he's totally involved in some activity then you giving an instruction from behind is not going to work so four to five year olds can become very self absorbed go close to him and tell him and he will uh, come back to you 